1977, the Automatics played their first ever gig, and that lead singer, Tim Strickland, was reading the lyrics off sheets of paper. A live performer reading things off sheets of paper. <laughs> Absolutely disgusting. <laughs> <laughs> Irony alert. <laughs> Jane Davis went to see a band called Squad and he'd heard that they had an absolutely incredible lead singer who was very enigmatic and used to sing with his back to the audience staring at the wall. It was a guy called Terry Hall. And um, uh, Jane Davis approached him at the end and asked him if he could replace uh, Strickland in the band and history was made. Jane Davis joined the band uh, The Automatics who went on to become the special specials and they got a residency at Mr George's nightclub. Lyric number two, Terry Hall. A Coventry singer called Terry, notorious for not being merry, Lead singer for Squad, his delivery was odd. Was he good in the specials? Yes, very. <laughs> Start to get the hang of Limerick now. <laughs> Terry is much easier to rhyme than Dabbers. <laughs> so, uh, the first manager of the specials was a guy you may have heard of, it, a guy called Pete Waterman. Mm -hmm. Better known as the Hitman with a capital S. He <laughs> was, of course, involved in the stock Aiken Waterman uh, hit factory, and factory was definitely the right word for it. And he was only very briefly a member of the specials, for which they should be so lucky, 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 lucky. <laughs> but he did bring in a rockabilly guitarist called Ruddy Radiation, who became a really important part of the specials. Um, Pete Waterman, in his biography, likes to brag about the fact that he was the man that discovered the specials. But in his biography, uh, Horace Panzer, the bass player, says, discovering the specials in Coventry at that time was like discovering an armchair in your living room. <laughs> they were just destined to be big. He tried to get Johnny Rotten, a.k.a. John Lydon, into the band. That would have been a, a very different history for the specials and uh, never quite made it. I was quite a big fan of the Sex Pistols, but I got a bit annoyed with Johnny Rotten a few years later because he started advertising Country Life Butter, do you remember? <laughs> and it, it's horrible when you're heroes like you down like that, isn't it? The great punk legend, Iggy Pop, he started advertising car insurance a couple of years later. So, uh, have you seen that thing at football where they hold up big pieces of paper that says, Erling Haaland, can I have your shirt? Marcus Rashford, can I have your shirt? I tried that at Iggy Pop gig. Complete waste of time. <laughs> the uninitiated, he never wore a shirt. <laughs> so then they released this fantastic single, it became the specials, and they released a brilliant single, I'm sure you all remember it, it was a song called Gangsters, uh, with the opening line, Bernie Rhodes knows, don't argue. And Bernie Rhodes also gives us a punk connection, because Bernie Rhodes was the manager of The Clash, and he saw the specials, he was very impressed, he decided to take them on as well. But the first gig he raised for them has gone down in folklore, and actually forms the lyrics of Gangsters. It was over in France, and they went over on the, uh, on the Dover ferry. And when they arrived, first of all, the drummer Silverton Hutchison was immediately deported because he had a Barbadian passport and things weren't good for black people in, in France at that particular time. And the van that they sent to the ferry to pick them up was too small for the band and the instruments. So the black guys in the band and the instruments went on the van and the white guys had to hitchhike. By the time they got to the hotel, they found out that all their instruments had been confiscated by the hotel managers. Nothing to do with the specials, but a couple of weeks earlier, a British punk band called The Damned had stayed in the same hotel and decided to smash it up. All together, ooh, ooh, smash it up, smash it up, just be okay, fair enough. So they blamed the specials for that, even though it was nothing to do with them, and uh, they became very disillusioned uh, with the whole thing. There's a line in um, Gangsters that says, don't interrupt while I'm talking, or I'll confiscate all your guitars, and that's where it comes from. Uh, there's a line where they talk about using the law to commit crime. So the specials were getting very politicised. Um, because of what was happening. And also, uh, Gangsters was a reworking of an old Prince Buster song called Al Capone, in which Prince Buster sang, Al Capone knows, don't argue. They changed it to Bernie Rhodes, clearly indicating that he was something of a gangster. Phil Jupiter, the comedian, was a massive fan of the specials, and he once described them as righteous indignation that you could dance to. I can't do better than that. <laughs> and there's also that line about, um, uh, as well as Bernie Rhodes knows, don't argue, we've got the line that goes, don't call me Scarface, possibly the most famous line in the song. And that was uttered by a guy called Neville Staple, who now joined the band. Limerick number three, Neville Staple. A cool as hell singer called Neville, a vibrant and talented devil. His spontaneous toasting, his rhythmical boasting, took the band to a whole new high level. Not funny, but it rhymes. <laughs> so, of course, we know that when the specials exploded in the late 1980s, it was a time of racial violence. There really was too much fighting on the dance floor. There was high unemployment. There was disillusioned youth. There was communities being crushed and dismantled. And against all that, we had the threat of nuclear war. But it was fine, because we told we just had to duck and cover. <laughs> if you dived under a kitchen table and put a tin bath on, on top of yourself, radiation obviously couldn't touch you. <laughs> that was the theory. A few years ago, I went to um, one of my favourite cities in Europe is Berlin. And there used to be uh, a museum in Berlin called the, uh, the Berlin Experience. I think it's closed now. Brilliant museum. Terrible name. It sounds like a kind of German version of a soul band doing German versions of all the old soul classics. I heard it through the glue vine. 
what becomes of the sovereign territories. <laughs> Reach out, I'll be there, better move on from there. <laughs> but then, of course, along came Mikhail Gorbachev, and we had Glasnost, we had Perestroika, the Russians became the good guys, and we all lived happily ever after. <laughs> no. <laughs> so this is called Safe and Sound. Warning, warning, nuclear attack. Fingers itching and twitching on the button to wipe out the planet with a flick of the wrist. Gluttons for global punishment, the cowboy and the communist. We're rabbits in the headlights of Armageddon, where every fragile life is fried into a dead end. Meanwhile, underground, the powerful and the wealthy can be found. They're also terribly, terribly sorry to lose you, but they're also safe and sound. I'm the man in grey, I'm just a man at CNA, and I don't have a say in the war games that they play. And it wasn't just about America and Russia, was it? We had our own dictator, Margaret Thatcher. I was getting a little bit worried about talking about Auntie Thatcher, but everything's red in here, so we should be okay. <laughs> and of course, um, Margaret Thatcher won three elections somehow, um, propped up by the right-wing press, like the Daily Telegraph and the Daily Mail, or as I prefer to call them, I can't believe it's not gutter. <laughs> <laughs> of course, she did win the Falcons War, single-handedly. She also closed all the mining communities, single clawed. But she was a mother as well. She had two children, she had Mark, who got lost in the desert. Mind you, if I was Margaret Thatcher's son, I'd also lose myself in the desert. <laughs> she also had a daughter called Carol, the journalist who was in that TV programme, I'm out of here, get me a celebrity. <laughs> I think I've got that right. And of course, uh, Carol Thatcher in that programme had all sorts of weird insects that could have easily poisoned her and killed her. Mind you, if I was Margaret Thatcher's daughter, <laughs> don't need to finish that one, do I? <laughs> so this is called The Wicked Witch of the West. I see no hope, I see only sorrow. I see no choice, cho chance for the bright youth tomorrow, so stand down, Margaret. Stand down, please. Stand down, Margaret. The wicked witch of the West, she shut the pits and left communities bereft of livelihood and dignity in the depths of doleful debt, with no regret or humanity. Sent stormtroopers in to come down hard on pickets armed with collection tins and peaceful placards. I see no joy, I see only sorrow, and empty promises of jam tomorrow, so stand down, Margaret. Stand down, please. Stand down, Margaret. The Wicked Witch of the West still fills us with disdain. It would have been a start if she'd only had a heart or a brain. But somewhere over the rainbow, there's nothing but an empty pit. No pot of gold, just a crock of shit. Does anybody know any jokes? <laughs> so um, I said before how depressing it is when your heroes let you down. And um, there's a guy called Elvis Costello who actually, uh, did actually produce the first specials album. And he once did a song called Trap the Dirt Down, about how he was really looking forward to Margaret Thatcher dying so he could dance on her grave. And about three or four years ago, he accepted an OBE because he said his mum would like it. On the same day, Fergal Sharkey, the lead singer of The Undertones, also accepted an honor, order of the British Empire, which, given that he was brought up in the box side during the Troubles, is absolutely unbelievable. I actually did a show called uh, More Jokes About Chocolate and Girls in Derry uh, for The Undertones, and a couple of The Undertones turned up. And we're not big fans of Fergal Sharkey because of what had happened. As I say, it's terrible when your heroes let you down. And I used to be a massive fan of a guy called Morrissey, and particularly a band called The Smiths, but just recently he's lurched to the right and I find it very difficult to listen to him. The left-wing singer-songwriter Billy Bragg wrote a song about the Hillsborough, um, thing, uh, the, the Hillsborough disaster, which he calls Scousers Never Buy the Sun. So I kind of slightly reworked that lyric in a poem that I call Mozza Never Buys the Guardian. <laughs> Someone sings on Jimmy Fallon with For Britain on his pin. He's too smug to be embarrassed as he helps the fascists win. He claims that he's the victim and he was only having fun but Mozza never buys The Guardian. While he calls the paper wretched for its one-man hate campaign, he escaped the streets of Stretford to avoid the heavy rain. Each day he sups his champagne in the California sun, and Mozza never buys The Guardian. The boy with thorns inside him, who sang about a dead queen, had masters who were bastards and Margaret on the guillotine. But when he draped himself in the Union flag, that's when it all went wrong, and Mozza never buys The Guardian. Last international playboy, needs to hang his head in shame. Caligula would blush to see what he will do for fame. When you put your faith in Farage, it's time your big mouths got struck dumb. And Mozza never buys The Guardian. The back catalogue of Smith's songs, the soundtrack of my youth, with Johnny Marr on lead guitar and words of brutal truth. He spews out hate at the cemetery gates. Every DJ wants him hung. And Mozza never buys The Guardian. Just what difference does it make? Well, frankly, it makes none if Mozza never buys The Guardian. <laughs> yeah.